Well, if you'd pray with me as we come to look at that passage together. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us through this, your word this morning? Bless the preparation that has happened and uh, help me to speak uh, what you have revealed through your word clearly. Help us to listen and by your spirit be changed that we may follow you, we may trust you. We may encourage each other to do both of those things too. To the glory of your name. Amen. Well, I wonder, what is a promise worth? From a politician, maybe? What's a promise worth? We probably estimate not much, don't we? Nations break promises to other nations. Politicians are well known for not keeping their word. What about promises from a product? What's that promise worth? Enough to make you part with your money? But it has to be noted that products might have guarantees, but it sometimes is a battle to have them honoured, isn't it? And businesses no longer conduct their dealings with a handshake and a promise guaranteed by someone's word, do they? What is a promise worth from a partner or a friend? Sadly, too often we see that even those are broken. Promises within friendships and marriages, too often in churches too. Promises are thought to be of light value and easy to ignore. What is a promise worth from you personally? It's sad to say that actually around us and maybe even in ourselves today, promise keeping is a dying art. But as we come to this psalm and see it's about promise making and promise keeping, we are to have hope. Because it is about two sets of promises between David, from David to God and then God to David, both of which are kept. Now, there's one or two things we just need to think about before we dive into this psalm. Um, we live near the Peak District. I assume most of us probably at some point have been walking in the peaks or other kind of hilly areas. And this, recently I've even been walking and we found that I am absolutely useless at finding my way. But another time I went with a friend who did know the way and I wished I'd ignored him too. Because he took us up, have you ever, uh, heading out of Castleton up Winnets Pass, he took us up the hill at the side. Just to bring us back down the other side onto the road that we could have walked up before we even started climbing the real hill. And it was the hottest day of the year. But that is a little picture of how this psalm works for us. Because as we looked at that hill, the hill we wanted to climb, it looked like we were heading towards it. It looked like we were heading towards the hill we were trying to climb. But a little perspective and wisdom and much water drinking later, we realized it was not the hill, but the first of several. And so, as we come to this psalm, we need to understand that that is how it's working. This psalm works on three and four levels. At each stage, the promises are made and kept. But at each stage as we move on, they are kept to a a more full uh, level, all leading to the final peak of a mountain. Now, if you've used our listening to a Bible talk sheet, you will recognize some of the symbols that are about to come because I've nicked them from this timeline. Because it's each point as we climb a hill in this, we're going to see where are we. As we look at the psalm, the first kind of hill is the, is the first peak, is the life of David. The promises in this psalm are fulfilled in David's life. We'll see the traveling of the ark of God to Jerusalem in the days of David. And that is early in the time that Israel had kings. Because David was only the second one. And if you're looking at our timeline sheet, that's the symbol that tells you roughly where we are. Now, if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you'll know what the ark was perhaps like. 
It was a symbol of God's presence among his people. The ark had accompanied them from Israel from Sinai to Israel. They built it in the desert at God's instructions to provide a mark of the presence of God among the people. It's history and it traveling with them so many hundreds of years later marks the importance of having God with you. It showed that God was with his people, that God was over and above his people, because God was quite obviously not in the box. It would eventually be deposited in the most holy place of the temple, the spiritual focal point of the pilgrimages that we're working through the hymn book of uh, last summer and this summer. And note, this is coming towards the end of the section. So this is a song towards the end, towards the climax of the pilgrimages. And so it's placed towards the end of the collection, which is the second peak of the mountain range that we're climbing this morning. Because the second peak is how the people, after David's time, would process all the way across Jerusalem from the gates of the city to the temple itself, remembering what God had done and how he was at the center of their lives and community. That was especially important because this hymn book was probably assembled post Exile after they had lost the land, the temple, and the ark. But to remember that God was going to keep his promises. And if you're watching our timeline, that's the little symbol we use for the rebuilding as they came back. Think of how these festivals and these pilgrimages would still be happening by Jesus' day, which is the third peak. The Psalms' fulfillment for us today, for the church. When the promises of God about a king find their fulfillment in the coming of Jesus and how we find life in Christ. And so we now can sing this song, trusting in the promises we've seen fulfilled, but also waiting for one final mountain peak of fulfillment. Jesus' new kingdom. And that will be permanent, so there's no coming down from the end of that peak, which is why I've cut it off for you on the screen. When the Lord Jesus Christ will return and bring his people to his new kingdom. Now we're going to move between all of those time settings as we go this morning, but I'm going to try and put the right logo in the corner of the screen as we go to give you an idea of where we are. But we're going to dive in to the psalm, which has, it works in two halves. The two sets of promises are what we're going to look at. And the first ten verses commend to us a pattern of dedicated worship and service despite affliction. The psalm is built around a single incident of the past, the history of the Ark of the Covenant. And it reminisces over it. David is talking before it happened, its journey, what it means. Before we get to the event, though, we're reminded of David's involvement he is, remember, is their king. He was their greatest king. And how the act of it moving to the temple was him keeping an oath he had made to the Lord. Look with me at verses 1 to 5. O oh Lord, remember David, all the hardships he endured. That's someone assembling the hymn book commenting. He swore an oath to the Lord and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will not allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. David's concern is that God, who set him on the throne, should have a place at the center of the life of his people. He should be the most important thing at the center of their lives. That's why place is important in this psalm. You may be noticed as Fred read it for us. Verse 5, a place, a dwelling. Verse 7, dwelling place. 8, resting place. 13, dwelling. 14, resting place forever and ever. And the word sit. You see, at the start of David's uh, at the start of his reign, David resolved to do whatever it took to bring the rule of God to his throne over Israel. 
And this and the events it describes as that promise of David is fulfilled is peak one of our mountain range, which verses 6 to 10 describe for us. It recounts for us the story, verse 6, of David and his men hearing in Ephratha, which is David's home, Bethlehem, that the Ark of the Covenant has been found in the fields of J. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, we can find out that name is actually Kiriath Jirim. And I'm glad they uh, uh, abbreviated it. Over the last few weeks, I found out that, you, you, that some places ha- have to abbreviate their name on road signs. Think that's what's happening here. So over the last few weeks, I found out driving around that Soton is the version of Southampton that fits on the road signs. Because one, and apparently it was developed actually originally by newspapers because Southampton didn't fit on a headline nicely, and so they abbreviated it. Well, that's what's going on here. This is a shortened name for this other place. The location of the ark seems to have been forgotten during the reign of the previous king, Saul. And it was only found there later, in David's day, after a time of serious searching. I forgot to animate the steps there. They determined then, verses 7 8, to move the ark to Jerusalem so that the covenant God, the covenant being promise making and promise keeping God, may dwell there and rule according to the good law enshrined in the Ten Commandments, the same stone tablets of which are inside the ark. Now, the events of this are described for us in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And if we know that story, we'll know that it wasn't straightforward. It was a journey fraught with danger, and one episode caused David a great amount of sorrow. Because one man, who was escorting the ark as it was being pulled pulled along on a cart by cows, reached out to steady it as the as the uh, uh, cows stumbled and it was about to fall off. But he was killed instantly. Because while the box, the ark was a box, maybe 45 inches long and 27 inches wide and 27 inches deep, constructed of wood that was covered with gold, with little angel-like figures at either end, it was just a box, but it symbolized the presence of God, and on no account was anyone to go near it or touch it without the strictest of instructions. It showed the way it was transported, a neglect of God's holiness and instructions. And that tragedy affected David deeply. In fact, the ark stayed where it was, a a local house, for three months. However, when David heard that there, there was blessing on that house because of the ark, he moved it again. This time, he did it properly. He did it the way God had shown his people. And so the ark came to Jerusalem at last. Why? Why all this hassle? Why not give up after it's cost someone's life? Well, because then, verse 9 and 10, there will be a place to act with access to God, where priests will serve giving access to God. That's the role of a priest, creating a joyful people under an anointed king, serve with the Lord God at the center of their lives. David was so passionate about God's glory and that God's name that he wanted to build a real building for that ark to go in, a temple rather than the tent and the misplaced ark that had been the system before. See, he thought it was dreadful that the symbol of God's presence, this ark, should dwell in a tent. He thought it demeaned God's honor and name. And so David's oath is that he will not rest until he had done this for the Lord. David, as I'm sure we've heard described several times in this series, was described by God himself as a man after God's heart. And whilst it did later turn out that God will say, David, you're not going to build that, it was his desire, it was his priority. That's what he thought God was worth. Notice too then that David was not alone in that attitude. 
Verse 7 is a description of his people. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. The attitude there is that they too, like David, long to worship God and be with him. They have a devoted commitment to the Lord's cause. And so as this festival parade accompanied the ark into Jerusalem, the people rejoiced. We're even told that David danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. Now, if David was so gripped by the glory and honor of God's name, if he was so committed to the Lord's cause, even though he never saw it full, uh, the full fulfillment of the promises, then how much more should we be who have seen the fulfillment of God's promises? Can we honestly say that we have David's zeal and passion for the cause of the Lord? Do we throw ourselves wholeheartedly into his work as David did? Are we so passionately committed to his cause that we would be willing to suffer hardships and tragedy as David did? Because we have seen the fulfillment of promises. We have seen all the promises of God come to fruition. We know that God does not dwell in a temple made by human hands, but instead came and dwelt among us as a man, Jesus Christ. So one person writes, this psalm, this psalm shows obedience as a lively, adventurous response of faith that is rooted in historical fact and reaches into a promised hope. But I think that should be rewritten to say it shows worship and obedience. Worship and service as lively, adventurous responses of faith. So if you're a Christian here today, we know that, yes, one of the joys of being a Christian is to know we are forgiven, and we'll celebrate that with communion later. But new life in Jesus is following him and serving for his glory. So what about our worship? Is it zealous and passionate, or is it mediocre and a bit flat? And that can work for music or just our effort. Because, of course, worship is not just our singing. We're encouraged in the Bible whenever we are, particularly when we're discouraged, to lift up our hands in adoration to God, to look at him, and that will put everything else in its right place. We talked earlier about how we encourage each other as fellow Christians, and one way we do that is when we gather together. How encouraging is it when you're not the only voice warbling in a congregation? You're not the only person gathering to pray. What do we desire to do in service to God? Do we desire to be wholehearted? Or is our hope to get away with just dishing up the leftovers of what we have? I came across a quote this week from G.K. Chesterton who said this, let, relig let your religion, let your faith, let your worship be less of a theory and more of a love affair. I'm thinking about how, despite these were David's promises, it was God who brought them to their fulfillment. How is God leading us into his service plan for us? Is he revealing giftings and skills as you serve? Or is that impossible because that would require you to have actually started first? Champion race car driver Dale Earnhardt Hart was known for being calm before races. So calm he would occasionally catnap behind the wheel just before the start. 
But in 1997, he intentionally took this catnapping to a dangerous new level, falling asleep at the wheel, but continuing to drive in the race. When he reached the first turn, he hit the wall, but kept going. At the second turn, he hit the wall, but kept going. He continued slowly around the track for two laps, looking for his pit, but unable to find it. Finally, he pulled off the track and would later say he remembered nothing of it. Sixteen doctors examined him and, to find out what happened, but found nothing definite. But what is frightening is that he was able, for a while, to drive at over 100 miles an hour whilst asleep. But in the same way, can't we be busy racing through life? Our eyes seemingly open, our hands on the wheel, our foot to the floor, but yet spiritually asleep. Not giving God his due honour, not seeking to serve him, because he is the only one worthy of service. Sooner or later, though, trouble will begin. And you think, yes, well, I want to serve. Okay, that's great. Yes, how? But, but I look at these people like the Davids. Uh, and I hear these about men and women who are so passionate for God that I think that can never be me. After all, David said, effectively, I will not rest until I've done this. David vowed more than he could fulfill. It was not ultimately David who built the temple, but Solomon. But what he had grasped was who God is. And therefore, if we see exactly who Jesus is, well, that will drive that total commitment. That will create, grow in as a love of the Savior such that the result will be serving him passionately with total devotion. I said Solomon, his, David's son, was ultimately the person who built the temple because God said, no, Solomon's going to do it. Interestingly, as the Bible records that event, that's not meant to be the slide there. I don't know where we are. No, I'm leaving there. Uh, that's, the Bible records Solomon praying verses 9 and 10 of this psalm when the temple is first consecrated. The people of God now pray it post-exile where there's no longer a king. Yeah, there we are. We'll do a peak two. So let's look at the pr prayer. At the heart of this prayer in the first half is a king. It's a prayer for a king, that God will remember David, the good king, the king that he made promises to, we'll talk about that in a minute, and not reject future kings. As this old ark song was re-sung by the people of God on a pilgrimage to, across Jerusalem, historical memories were revived and relived. There was a vast, rich reality of worship and service beneath the feet of these disciples they're not the first persons to climb that hill in Jerusalem on their way in obedience to God they will not be the last because verse 10 is a prayer for the continued faithful reign of anointed kings the base of the prayer is a king who has sacrificial humbled him, sacrificially humbled himself Think of the self-denial of David's oath in his promise. The psalm expects the present king to inherit David's role as a responsible servant who bows the knee in worship and service. Only a king who determines to do whatever it takes to establish the kingdom of God on earth will answer the need of this prayer and point, make, bring glory to God. And so, as we see words and phrases like anointed one, verse 10, we're meant to look beyond. That word points us to the word Messiah or Christ. So the prayer anticipates that one day a greater king than David will humble himself, even to a cross. That he may do whatever it takes to bring the kingdom of God to earth. See, looking forward to peak three 
And so as we pray this psalm today, the prayer of verses 1 to 10 is sweet with assurance because we see the, have seen the first coming of Jesus. We know it happened. But we also then long for his future return in glory. But we can have confidence in that, in God's promises. Verses 11 and 12 match David's oath with what is now God's promise. Verses um, as God makes promises to David. The prayer was, do not reject your anointed one. The second half of the psalm comes back with, the Lord swore an oath to David. A sure oath he will not revoke. You see, with no king here at peak two, back from exile, rebuilding, but weak and subject, with no likelihood of a king in the line of David being able to reign, the concern is, well, okay, David kept his promises, but will God? And the second half of the psalm counters those questions by saying, no, God won't turn from his promises. In fact, this psalm proclaims the success and glory of God's promises. So look with me, the second half of verse 11. One of your descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the, status, the statutes I teach them, then your son shall sit on your throne forever and ever. The original account of God's promises to David are found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. They promise that God will establish the people in their own land. He will give David an heir to succeed him. That successor will be blessed, although he will also be disciplined if he does wrong. And the successor will actually build the temple. And that the throne of David will then be established forever. The last and most important words of, of the covenant are this. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. What's most striking about the verses that follow that then is that they correspond to the promises in the first half, but they go, the answer go beyond what's asked. So the people had asked God, verse 8, to come to his resting place as the ark was brought to Jerusalem. But in verse 14, God says, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. In the first half of verse 9, they asked righteousness for their priests. Verse 16, God says, I will clothe her priests, as Zion's, with salvation. And her saints, so I'll come to that one in a minute, in, in the second half of verse uh, 9, God, the people had asked that the saints might sing for joy. But in this half, God promises her saints, yes, shall sing for joy, but there's an extra word. Shall ever sing for joy. You see, God will keep his promises. He will answer the prayers and the promises that David has made. But he will go beyond. And so two levels of promise going on here. Promise to David and his heirs. They will not cease to occupy the throne to be the house or the dynasty of David as long as they keep the covenant and its statutes. Peak one. But it looks forward to the promise of a divine Messiah who alone will perform all the requirements of the law and rule forever. Now, it is good to remember that the promise of a Messiah is always in the background when the Bible is talking about God's covenant with David. But here it's particularly explicit. He, it goes on to talk about Zion, verse 14. See, from the promises that you already see fulfilled, from this song collection, singing at peak two, God's people can look back. Kings ruled on David's thrones for centuries to come. Yes, there is one missing now, 
So can we look forward to peak three with hope? Can we look forward from where we are, the people singing the song ask? Because time and again they know the kings from David's lines were un- line were unfaithful. They didn't fulfill their side of the bargain. They broke their promises. And so God kept his. They were disciplined. The nation were disciplined. Does that mean there will be a point where God says, that's it. I've had enough. Well, the abundance of these promises tell us no. Because there came one last king who was faithful and who kept God's covenant. Jesus Christ. Or Jesus the Christ, the anointed king. He is the anointed king who reigns now in heaven. And he's the one who will rule over all things. He is the one who is on David's throne forever. And the fact that he is the faithful king is one of the biggest reasons to encourage us to be faithful as Christians. Because whilst David stands as a model for being passionate about God's cause, as we've already thought, the real example to us is David's greater son, the anointed one himself. And in Jesus, we see someone who is faithful all the way to death who was so devoted to the father's cause he gave up his life and if we claim to be followers of of this Christ then so too should we be seen to be faithful and zealous for Christ's cause too for he is the promised king who is faithful unto death who rules on David's throne forever pouring God's blessing on the people both physically and spiritually, verses 15 and 16 tell us. Now, there were times of blessing under the kings. Under Jesus, we're not talking about a golden age political philosophy uh, as others that have been promised. This is not a government solving all our problems. This is not a king solving all our problems temporarily. Because to trust a government or a physical king is to worship them in place of God. But this is to trust in God's plan and God's kingdom in the humble anointed king until his promised victory. Because then his kingdom will be visible and everyone will know. So the promise in verses 17 and 18 says this, Here, Zion, I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but the crown on his head shall be resplendent. The horn symbolizes royal power and victory and suggests that whilst David's line may have disappeared, it will grow, it will sprout up again. The crown is the picture of the king. And already we know that that victory has been attained because Jesus Christ died and rose again and when Jesus returns in glory he will finally crush forever his enemies and his people will reign with him again uh, will reign with him forever so this psalm says to us keep trusting keep going as we pray this psalm today the answer of verses 11 to 18 reassure us more so than they could have done for the people singing this first time. We can look forward to peak four, when one day Jesus will, Jesus Christ, the anointed king in David's line, will return to stand on the heavenly fulfillment of Mount Zion with all his people. In the meantime then, we who are on this walk, this journey, of the Christian life need to keep our eyes on him. For as we look to Jesus, we see the success and glory of God's promises, which we can put our whole trust in. And then in response, make our lives a pattern of worship and service to the one who made and keeps those promises. In a certain way, Psalm 132 jogs our memory it should grow in us 
the longing hope for being home with our Savior that leads us to obedience. See, he makes a home in our hearts and promises home with him in his throne room. So we welcome him into that home in our hearts. And the response is we serve his glorious purposes on our way home.